so um, I'm going to be talking about um, Bayesian variable selection, and um, and I will particularly focus on the unsupervised um, setting. Um, this is a joint work with uh, Pierre Alexandre Matei, who is now a junior researcher at INRIA, and uh, Charles Bouveron. And um, most of the work, or all of the work, was done at the University of Paris Descartes, and which is now the University of Paris. And uh, so the the idea is that I believe we 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 found an an interesting avenue of research, which is, which is quite general. And um, I'm I'm going to present it to you, and I'm going to start with uh, something simple, which is the, the linear model. This is the first work we published on this. And then we're going to apply it to unsupervised learning. But this way of doing things, I believe, is interesting. And I hope you're going to find it interesting and can be applied for very different uh, models. OK, uh, so that's, that's the plan. Um, I'm going to focus on variable selection and um, particularly focus when I start on linear regression, just to fix the ideas. Then when go to the unsupervised setting, Bayesian framework and see some applications and then we're gonna conclude. Right, so let's introduce um, this avenue of research. I mean, I wanna insist on this. I, I could have talked and I, uh, I could have talked about uh, other things and I chose this because I believe that you might find this useful and uh, it's an avenue of research. So you could think about this in different settings for different applications and uh, adapt it to your models and et cetera. So that's basically the avenue of research. Um, we wanna do variable selection. And for now, that's, that's quite general. So in, in a general perspective, you, you would start with um, a statistical model. Then you would, you would, uh, you would consider a, a prior. And this is absolutely key. Um, this is usually the, the moment where we spend a lot of time on, on, on this. We need to choose the, the right prior. And uh, there might be some choice regarding the, the parameters of the, of the prior. Because when you do this with those two ingredients, you want to get an exact expression of the marginal likelihood. So that's, that's the starting point. So whatever you're working on, whatever the, whatever the statistical model, you have the statistical model, you choose the prior distribution, but you, you spend a lot of time on, on the prior or on the calculation actually, on the, on the math. And with those two ingredients, you try to get something that you can compute in practice. And then the, the, the gold standard for many Bayesian is this marginal likelihood. Usually, you, it's very unusual to get an, an, an expression for this. Usually you rely on approximations, you do samplings, you, you, do, you do many things. And here, we wanna make sure we can compute this exactly. Then you, we spend a lot of time trying to come up with a, a technique to do the inference. And then we go back to this expression and we define something that we call a path of models. Because this expression is exact, we're gonna use it to do variable selection. As you're going to see, we're gonna face computational issues, because although we're going to be able to compute those quantities, we're never going to be able to optimize them exactly. So we're going to define a path of models and add the variables one by one in a clever way. And on, the, on this path of models, we always compute the exact expression of the marginal likelihood. And then you just choose the moment where you reach the maximal 
value of the marginal likelihood, right? So you look for the moment where you don't need to consider extra variables because if you do, the marginal likelihood is gonna go down, right? So you look for a peak in the marginal likelihood. That's the idea. So we need an exact expression. This expression is gonna be usually a little bit complicated. So we need some algorithm to do inference. And then to, to make a decision regarding the variables, we're gonna define a path of models. We're gonna add the variables one by one, and we're gonna look for the maximal value of the marginal likelihood. That's the general idea. So let's see first one example. I'm not gonna go into the details, um, because I want to focus on the unsupervised setting. But this, I believe, is useful to um, put things into perspective. So for a few minutes, let's consider the uh, linear regression model. Um, just to this very simple model. And to um, this is actually the model which started all this work on variable selection. We published the first paper on this, and then we showed how such a methodology could be applied for various settings. So we have, we want to do prediction. We are in a supervised setting. You want to predict all the outputs in Y, given all the inputs in X. You have, um, obviously, uh, regression vector beta and usually you want to usually you want to estimate this and as usual we have some we have some noise to make things simple we're going to consider here a white noise like, like gaussian and the uh, independent noise um right so that's the simplest uh model we have for regression and one of the key aspects is that if you have too many variables, so let's look at the notation. So small n in this talk is the number of observations. So we have it here and here. And p is the number of variables we have for the inputs, right? We have p input variables. Usually, when you are in a very simple setting, like a huge amount of observations, a few variables, you're just fine. You can, it's very easy. We, you can compute many estimators of, of beta, like the frequentis one, or you can do plenty of things. That's easy. But as long as P um, becomes large, or shall we say, n becomes smaller than p, or maybe much smaller than p, or less and less observations uh, compared to the number of variables. In that case, the classical MLE estimators um, and, and many others um, get, some, get into troubles. So what people do in practice is that they do sparse regression. They assume that, well, okay, so I'm going to assume that this weight vector here is actually sparse. That means that most or some of its coefficients are null. And by doing this, it's very helpful in doing inference. So what people do in practice is that they consider such uh, beta penalized. So instead of just minimizing this sum of square, people usually add a penalization. And uh, this penalization is controlled with an, a lambda parameter. This is something which is gonna be, which is going to be absolutely interesting, I believe, in, 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 a, in a few more minutes. So keep, keep this in mind. So lambda is something that controls the level of sparsity. 
And this is very classic. I mean, a huge amount of people have been working on this and actually too many, I would say. Uh, you could consider a penalization like this, um, where the penalization in beta is the, not um, that's the, that's a L0 uh, norm. You could do with the, that's, with this leads to an LPR problem. This is very hard to solve. Getting this beta hat is very hard. So this is why people use usually um, L1 norm. And this is to, this is the most famous norm. This is associated to lasso. And then you have plenty of them. This penalization, this one, elastic net, and plenty others. And for the last, I don't know, for the last um, 15 years, people have been using a lot of, lot of this in many situations. And I have to say, I was a little bit upset to see so many works doing exactly the same thing. So uh, like uh, many, like I would say like uh, 10 years ago, I thought that that would be, that could be interesting to, to try just to see if we could do something a little bit different, right? Instead of saying, um, I have a mean square error and I add penalization then, and I work, let's try to do something else to do variable selection. That's the first remark. And second, I was a little bit uh, upset with this idea that is that Lambda is actually not natural to find. What people do usually is that they do cross validation, right? So it's kind of, I do cross validation, I do a grid search and I try to get the Lambda. I wanted to get the framework where you would do both the estimation of the penalization itself and of the variable selection at the same time. That might be a question. Right. Any questions? Someone was raising their hand if you want, want to put a question up we can answer sure but I sure at the moment we don't seem to have one so okay uh, okay so i'm i'm gonna move on okay. okay so that's the idea that's that that was the motivation first that was just for fun let's try to do something else there there are a huge amount of people doing this last two things like as europeanization and then um cross validation to in grid search to estimate lambda let's try to do something else so we went back to this to this model, which is here, and we said, why not putting in a model perspective, in a model perspective, let's put some sparsity in the regression vector directly. So we break this down into two terms, where on the right hand side, you have like the classical, I would say, regression vector. That's something which is, um, this is a vector. That's a vector in, in, uh, in RP, right? And this is something that you are really interested in because if you know it, you can do your predictions. But you multiply on the left, well, here it's not, it's not important. That will be important in, for the unsupervised uh, setting. Here, you just use the Adama product, so the term by term product. And you multiply by this V vector. And V is binary, right? So that's something which is zero or one. So if that's a zero, when you multiply, you, you basically don't use the variable. And when it is one, you do use the variable. So with this simple idea, you get a vector where you have pure zeros and the remaining terms are just real values. That's, that's the thing. And then you put a white noise. So this is very classical. The, the noise you have is just Gaussian centered and uh, the, the variance is one of gamma. And we use a classical prior for W, which is this one. 
that's um, Gaussian uh, distribution, which is again centered. That's the prior centered. And with the covariance matrix, um, which is diagonal, and on the diagonal, you have this uh, one over alpha uh, term everywhere under the diagonal. Um, small remark, S such a prior has, be has been used a lot um, in the PhD thesis of uh, David uh, uh, Mackay, um, which is, um, uh, which who, who died a, a few years ago. He was, um, I believe, one of the um, nicest and interesting statistician I, um, I, I have read. And, and he came up with this idea in 2001, I would say, to use such prior to do regression and then, right. Here we are using this prior indeed, but for W, but remember this, uh, we have this prior, but on top of it, we have this binary vector here where, we, where you have a one, that means that the variable is active, et cetera. So if you look at the consequences of this, so first you make that choice for beta and then you choose such prior. The consequence of this is that the law of beta, the prior law, if you want, first, this law depends on V. V controls the variables which are active and, or not. And alpha controls the, the, controls the Gaussian prior. So basically controls um, the, the norm, the L2 norm of, of W as we're going to see in a, in a minute. So this writes like, like this, and this becomes this. So this is basically a way to explain the prior we chose. It's a product first over each of the variable. For each of the variable, you have a, a Dirac mass in zero. So if the variable is not active, you get a Dirac mass. So basically you get a pure zero. And if not, if the variable is, is, is active, it's, it's working, you get the prior, which is the same as the one which was used by David Mackay in, uh, from 2001 and then later on. And for some of you, you might have heard about uh, um, RRD uh, machines, automatic relevance determination and things like that. This, this comes from, from such, such work. So this is the prior we have. This is not something that we created. This comes from um, a family of methods and a family of prior, which are called spike and slab like prior. And this is very much related to the work of Michel and Bonchamp in uh, 88. So this is not brand new. This idea of considering some priors which have pure zeros, so, and then some Gaussian. This basically is called a spike and slab prior, and this comes from the work of Michel and, and Bonchamp. There are many ways to define spike and slab priors. You can put just a Gaussian with small variances instead of Dirac mass, and then Gaussian with large variance for the last for the remaining Gaussians. There are plenty of ways to do this. And in many cases, people would introduce an extra prior. They would put a prior on, on top of this. They would put a prior on V. And this is not something we do. So I would say this, this idea of spike and slab, it, it does not come from us. There are plenty ways of plenty of ways to do this. This is what we chose to do. So V here is a parameter. I'm not putting any Bernoulli or product of Bernoulli on, on V. 
I'm just considering V as an indicatrice uh, variable, vector. And there are two things to be controlled here, V and alpha. When you do this, that's something which is called sometimes type two maximum likelihood or marginal likelihood. This is a key quantity in Bayesian framework. That means that you are basically working with this quantity. You marginalize over the prior and the prior here is the one that we have here, right? Two. This is a prior which is introduced. That's the, the Gaussian we had. And we integrate over this unique prior. And we know always at every step of the, of the algorithm or the inference, we know that we control the sparsity through V. So it's a little bit technical and uh, but that's the idea. V is in here in this conditional likelihood, because remember that we in this in this statistical model in, in, in red, we we fixed this, right? Like uh, beta is, is just V Adamar product W, and we have here on W a prior. So this is why we are interested integrating with this prior. So this is a marginal likelihood. And when you do such a marginalization, what is left? The only thing which is left here um, is um, alpha, something controlling, as we're going to see the L2 norm, and then gamma, which is the, the noise of the, the, the variance of the, the inverse variance of the noise, so very classical. And then V, so V here is a parameter. So we need, and we're going to try to estimate this binary vector to select the variables. So we are not going to do MCMC or reversible um, um, germs or whatsoever, or any sort of sampling, or which are very common in spike and slab settings. Here we want to do optimization. So this is. Um, this is an empirical base framework. You want to get estimate. You don't want to do any sampling. You have a function and uh, you want to estimate it. So that's, that's the recipe. Changing the statistical model by adding something binary. Put a prior on the remaining part. Consider the marginal likelihood. And here, that's kind of okay, it's a, just a little bit of math, but that's kind of okay. This quantity here is exact. You can compute it exactly. And it has actually a very nice form. You can write it, uh, just put a minus here, but this is the quantity we are talking about. This is the so-called marginal likelihood, depending on V, alpha, and gamma. It can be written like this. So you have a, a very specific mean square error and you have a very specific penalization so at the end of this talk if you are interested in i can go back to 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 mv um if you want to to, to the form of this um this is not the the point of this talk so i don't want to spend too much time on this the key thing here is that all of this can is tractable and in particular look at look at the penalization we have a penalization like this, a penalization in, in M, right? So instead of having a W or beta, we have a new quantity or new vector, which is called M here. And look at the penalization we have. We have a penalization in, in L2. So we control the L2 norm. We have a penalization, so with, um, so, it, so it's very much read regression with an alpha here. We control at the same time the L0 of M with 
a very specific penalization, which is log alpha, why we have the alpha here. So it's some sort of elastic net, because in elastic net, you, you play with both L0 and L2 norms. But in elastic net, you have a lambda one for this part and then lambda two. Okay? Those two things, they are related to one another. You have an alpha here and a log alpha here. And, and then you have an extra term, um, which is given here and which basically controls the uncertainty of what you're doing. But that's, okay, so that's, that's the first result, something which is uh, very useful. And um, we derived some strategy to optimize this. And then if you're interested, we, we can go back to this. But my point here was to show you what we are doing, the, 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 the recipe, if you want, the avenue of research. I'm going to try to do exactly the same thing within the unsupervised framework. And to do um, this, a quick question, actually, I mean, maybe sure. like, I'm just curious sure. about your thoughts about like this framework. Uh, Andrew Gelman often sort of says, "Don't don't do marginal likelihoods. Do model expansion." Is it is this a matter of taste, or do you do you have something to I say, say about this? So yeah, yes, I, I'd say um, it's a matter of taste, and in particular in the Bayesian framework, you. It's like a like a religious belief, I would say. Uh, you have some parts of the Bayesian family, um, some members who are a huge fan of the empirical base framework and other who are not. Um, I'm from the first part. I do like this way of doing things. It, I mean, it, it seems it's also, it's a discrete versus continuous debate, I think, where you've got uh, your, if I've got the notation right, your V sure. is. Is, is, sure. So there's also that. Anyway, I, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. <laughs> um, okay. So now, oh, sorry. There's one more question. Um, sorry, Tom Lodo. It's uh, how is the m vector related to the beta? And that's the the mv here is the. I don't know how familiar you are with the. The Bayesian linear framework, but this MV here is just the essentially it's related to the posterior law. You you would get um, uh, let's say let's say this that's the posterior law you would get uh, simply from the data, right? or let's say let's say beta. It's just the posterior law. Sorry, that's a beta. Wait, that's just the posterior law of beta given the data and the parameters, um, which are V, alpha, and gamma. And this is tractable. This is this is this is Gaussian. And um, the, 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 there is there is a specific M. And then, and then you have a specific uh, co covariance matrix. So M here is the mean of the posterior distribution in beta, which is completely tractable. So I hope it uh, answers the, the question. So instead of having beta here, as you would have usually, you, instead of having beta, you have the mean of the posterior distribution of a beta. And if we go further, if you're interested in to, that means that basically, because this posterior is tractable, you can, you can use an EM algorithm here. You can use EM to, to work with this, estimate the parameters, look for the posterior in beta, et cetera, et cetera. But that's, that's this, okay? Okay, so now, before I go into the details, now we move to the unsupervised framework. So what does that make? Uh, what, what is the idea of doing variable selection in an unsupervised city? That's, that's a key question. You have a data set. There are no targets. You don't want to predict anything. You just have data. That's all you have. And in a principal way, 
you want to be able to say, okay, I don't have any goals. I don't know what I'm going to do with the data, but I want to have a principal way of saying in general, these are the variables which are useful and these are the variables which are not. To do this, we need a model. We need a way to address this issue, which is not trivial. And the way we did this is to look at models related to, to PCA and PPCA. So you, you know PCA, it's a very famous. It goes back to the early uh, 33 with the work of Otling. I'm not going to get back to this. And um, PCA is used uh, a lot. But PCA is not used for variable selection. PCA is used to project data into a low dimensional space. When you do this, the new space you create depends on all the variables you had at first. It's not variable selection. It's when you do PCA, you project into a lower dimensional space. PCA does not answer the question I, 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 I fixed. My question is, in principle, if I have a data set, can I select the variables? PCA is not an answer. But that's one element of the answer. And this is one data set that we have been working with a lot. Um, you have some spectroscopic uh, data. This comes from the um, Hôpital Européen Georges Pompidou in, in Paris. We have um, over 110 patients. And we have some, some spectrum for, for each patient. So for each patient, we have a spectrum which is described by um, over 800 variables. So that's the idea. That's I-dimensional, about 100 observations and 800 variables. So typically here, that would be key to be able to say which are the variables which are useful or not. And you are particularly in, you are in a high dimensional sitting here. So that's the idea of PCA. So um, in, in look at the, at this graph here. So just make sure you realize that this is X transpose here, right? So I have transposed the matrix. So the, the variables are, the variables are, are here. The observations are, are here. And when you do PCA or when you do low rank decomposition, you try to write your matrix as such a product. You have here um, something that we're gonna call a loading matrix. And this is why that you are interested in. You wanna get this. You have the same number of observations, but instead of having P variables, you have D variables. So again, it's not variable selection here. It's the projection, each, um, each observation here, for example, this one, is projected into a lower dimensional space here with less uh, dimensions. But the, I haven't selected in any way um, the variable in the input. But still, we want to keep on moving. We're gonna, we want to keep on using this, this idea to select this, this thing here. Right, so um, in this sitting, people have tried a lot of things for the last um, 15 years. They, because you can't use just simple PCA, you can't use PCA because the, the problem is high dimensional. Um, there are too many variables. So you can't just say, even if I wanted to, I could not use PCA because there are too many variables with respect to the number of observations. So what people do in practice is that they had zeros in this loading matrix. And as we saw in linear regression, when you add zero constraints, it can be helpful in getting some results. So I don't want to do PCA, but if I wanted to, 
that could be useful to add some to add some zeros. And here, as you can see, the zeros are put just about everywhere on this matrix. But let's assume now that we want to do something a little bit more clever. Maybe we can try to put some zeros in a row way. So put some rows, fill some rows completely with zeros, right? So when I when I, I'm, I'm going to introduce some constraints where entire rows are going to be zeros. So this is something that we call globally sparse PCA or GS PPCA. Globally sparse, you know, in, in, in a sense that you put entire rows of the loading matrix to, to zero. Something that you, you can see in this picture is that if if the model is like this, you just do linear algebra, essentially that means that this variables are useless. Because remember, this is x transpose. So, so that's the idea. If I can find such a matrix to build this, and when I do this, I put the zeros, when I do, that's gonna be a way to select the variables here. I hope you can you can see this. I have X. My goal first is to say, let's look for a projection. Let's for let's look for a projection Y. Uh, preserving the information. But I want to do this projection Y in a clever way. I want to introduce entire rows. And when I do this, if I am capable of putting the right zeros in W, I'm gonna. I'm going to have selected the variables in X in a principal way. So that's the way we address the problem. Look for Y, which preserves the information in the low dimensional space. And to do this, look for a projection matrix with plenty of zeros. And when you find the right one, such that Y preserves, preserves information, naturally, you would have selected the variables in, in X. That's the idea. OK, um, so we need, a, we need to do this with statistics. So we cannot just say um, this um, with the PCA. We need a model on top of PCA to use the tricks and to talk about marginal likelihood, we need, we need a model. So this is the so-called PPCA model, very famous, which has been used a lot. This is the way we see PCA in statistics. So this is the model. For each observation X, we assume that X can be written in a low dimensional Y. So X is of dimension P as usual, why that's the low uh, dimensional uh, projection so it's in dimension d and then there is a noise remember this the noise here um depends on sigma square right so that's the that's the variance and um so that's that's a model and if you just uh, play with this statistical model and look at the maximum likelihood estimator of, of this quantity here. This is a result which is very well known. The M maximum likelihood estimator of W is completely related to the PCA result. So you just build A, which is a matrix of ordered principal eigenvectors of this. You build lambda, which is a diagonal matrix with corresponding eigenvalues. And here is the link in between uh, PCA and PPCA. Basically, um, when you do um, PPCA, you are basically building a, a latent space which is very much related to, to PCA. PCA is the natural way of seeing PCA in statistics.
So we have the model and we want to add sparsity, but with through rows. I need to put rows. So I'm going to use my recipe. I'm going to multiply here as we did for the linear regression. I'm going to multiply here on the left by a matrix like this, which is, this is not a vector. This is the diagonal, this is a diagonal matrix of, of the vector. Right, so it's it's a matrix like this, full of zeros, and then on the diagonal you have v. So when you when you do this, you do exactly what you want to do. That puts entire rows to zero, and some of them are going to stick to one. So small v is exactly the one we had before. Right, sorry. This is the so-called binary vector. So we have introduced, not in the prior directly, but within the model, we have introduced the sparsity, the pure zeros, simply by multiplying on the left. Then what do you have left? The only thing you have left essentially is W. So we need a prior for W and guess what? We use exactly the, the same as before. We use this for, this, this Gaussian prior. So for each element of this loading matrix, we use the same Gaussian prior we had before. And now here's the problem. We want to maximize this marginal likelihood. So you have the data and you want to get the sparsity, you want to control the, the L2 norms. And this is the the, the variance of the noise as we had before. So it's very similar to what we have seen in linear regression. So this is the marginal likelihood. So we did uh, quite a lot of work with this. You can prove this. So it's, um, it's a very complicated expression and um, which is um, useless in practice. We tried to use it, but it didn't work because it involves an integral. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to go into the details, but remember that this expression is too complicated and numerically unstable, so it's useless in practice. And this is a Bessel function of order q divided by, by, by 2 minus, minus 2 minus 1. Right. Um, it's, it, it doesn't really matter because it's, it's useless. So people in the literature have come up with a lot of um, approximation. Um, people have tried to use um, Laplace approximation or variational approximation. So you have plenty of work on, on this and et cetera, et cetera. And um, we wanted to see in this PPCA model if it was possible actually to obtain a tractable marginal likelihood. So that, that's just math. Just, just play with this and try to see whether you can get, just you play with the integrals, you play with those functions behind, those Gaussians, those product of Gaussians, etc. You try to get an exact expression. We could not at first, so we came up with this idea. That's the trick, essentially, and it comes from this guy here. Always. So if you allow the noise to go down to zero, it is not, so the noise of the epsilon, the noise you have here, right? Remember this. You can easily prove that if you are in PPCA and you put the noise of this to go down to, to zero, so this, this noise here, it is not changing the latent space, right? So in the model, in the model perspective, if you reduce the variance of the noise down to zero, it's not changing the latent space. So that was the idea of OS. So we used this. We decomposed X into this PPCA term. And then you have one part regarding the um, active variables, and then one part regarding the inactive variables. 
And we looked as Rowes did in the simplest setting where you just have data that what you have and you just put the, the variance of, of the noise down to zero. That's exactly what we did. And um, so that's, there are two things here, PPCA, but you do decompose the noise in two terms, one associated with the inactive variables and one with the active variables. And because of the result of always in 88, you put this variance down to zero. The idea is to get an analytical expression while preserving the latent space. And actually, it works. It really works in practice. If you do this, you do this decomposition, and the last term, you put down the noise term down to zero, you get an exact expression for the marginal likelihood. It's given like this. Um, the first part is Gaussian, easy to compute. And the second one, that's, so that's a product in between. The second one is a Bessel distribution. But that's tractable. I mean, you can use it, that's implemented in R or Python. That's tractable. So you get an exact expression. And that's the first exact expression in PPCA of the marginal log likelihood. That's exact. You don't need to do Laplace. You don't need to do anything that's just exact and very easy to compute. And the computational cost is just about nothing here. No tractable. So it depends on three things. You have V, which is the hard part. So I'm going to talk about this later on. Then you have alpha and then Sigma one, which is the noise, or the variance of the noise of the inactive variable. And we found, because you need to, to set those values to, to work with, we found that um, a really good choice for Sigma one was just to do, when you have your data, you do um, PPCA, right? Simple like PPCA model, the classical one. And you just compute the mean of this P minus D smallest eigenvalues, right? So you, you, you do like, a, like PCA and you try to estimate the, the noise. So you compute the mean of the P minus D smallest eigenvalues of, of this. And that's an estimator for Sigma one. So you just put this in, in Sigma one. And what about alpha? It's kind of nice because this function here, which might look, I don't know, uh, this might look complicated. Actually, this function is concave in alpha. So um, so if, 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 you, if you know V, which we don't, you don't in practice, we'll see how to solve this. It's like a direct, to optimize the function and to get alpha because the function is univariate and concave. So you can, you, you can just do Newton, you're gonna get alpha. That's, that's easy. So for sigma one, that's just a tree we use. And for alpha, that's easy because this function is, is concave in, in alpha. Okay, and, uh, and what about V? Uh, we have a problem here, and this is the problem that everyone has faced huh. since the beginning of re regression and etc. We need to select the variables. There are two to the power p possible models because for each variable you can add it or you can uh, remove it. So what do you do? The idea is to essentially try to do, to get an estimation of this, which is not here, but is where it is in this 
space here. So we're going to do a relaxation here. Uh, this is the moment where um, you accept the fact that you're not going to do something perfect always from the beginning to, to the end. There is no way, although we have an exact expression here, we cannot optimize it with respect to NEV. It's a, combina it's a combinatorial problem. So what do we do? We do a relaxation. We're going to do optimization, but with B, not in not binary, but continuous um, between zero and, and P. Um, so this is the problem you have. You want to maximize this quantity here. And V is um, now continuous. So we are running a little bit of, out of time. So I'm, I'm going to go fast here. We have used a variational approach to get um, to get this uh, this v, and when it's continuous, we mentioned that u, the continuous um, relaxation, uh, this is. We, we use the variational algorithm. So I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this is a kind of um, simple strategy where you rely on mean field and uh, that's that's a way to optimize a function which is too complicated. So if, if you don't mind, I'm gonna skip this and I'm gonna go, go back to this if you if you want me to. But the idea is this one, we focus on this we use a VEM algorithm to, to work with all of those things. And we're gonna get, instead of getting a V, which is binary, we're gonna get the U, which is continuous. That's, that's the idea. So that's, that's the algorithm. I don't wanna spend too much time on this. I, I, I will if you, if you want me to. And now, how do you go from this U that we have just chose back to a binary one. That's the so-called idea of pass of models. Because in you, all your elements are in between zero and one. So you can rank them. And you can rank from the larger one to the smaller one. And then in this order, in this pass of models, you're gonna add the variables one by one and on this pass, you're going to compute this exact um, marginal log likelihood. So one example in practice is here, right? So in, in, in deep blue, these are the U we got, right? For the variables we had. So we have 30 variables. So we... we we, we use this variational algorithm, we get u, and we just rank the variables, the, 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 the u. So as you can see, some of them are very close to one, right? And um, there might be just like a 0 0.9999, et cetera, et cetera. And then they go down and then some of them are very close to zero. So you add them, you start with the model with no variables, and then you add them one by one. And each time, this is on the right-hand side, for each variable you add, you compute the exact max, uh, marginal likelihood. And in that case, this is we, we created the data. So Q, I forgot to say what Q was. Q is the true, the true number of variable of variables, right? So P is the one you have in your data. This is the low dimensional space and Q is what we are interested in. Q is the true number of variables um, in, in X. So we simulated some data and this is the type of graph that we produce. You use your VEM algorithm, you rank the, the, the U coefficients from 
the larger to the smallest, you add them one by one on this path of model and you compute an exact marginal likelihood. And you see that the peak is exactly where we wanted it to peak to be. <clears throat> um, I want to I want to conclude with with um, um, with with this uh, with two two applications instead of three. We did obviously a lot of simulations and uh, a lot of people have been working on those issues. Their goal, like uh, Bach and Obozinski and etc., their goal was not to select the variables. Their goal was to make PCA work or PPCA work in high dimension. Um, and um, so you have these sparse PCA, and then you have another one, and then you have our GSP PCA. Oh, obviously there are other methods, but we, we found that they, they, they led to worse, worse results. So in, this is one of the simulations we did. Um, the results are average over 50 runs. We have um, 200 variables. 20 is the true number of variables. The, the hidden space is in dimension 10. And this is the noise of the variance, the, the variance of the noise. And we have various settings. So you, you might look at this graph from the right to the left. So this is a setting where you have as many observations as variables. And then as you go on the left, you go to a setting where there are less and less observations. So it's harder and harder and harder. And here is the result we, we got. These are the results in terms of F score. So this is, um, this measures, um, and this is a 100. That's not a one, that's a 100, sorry. That's perfect here. So the goal here is to have 100. That means that you retrieve perfectly the variables which are active and the ones which are not. Um, so although they do not produce those SP, SPCA and SSPCA entire rows to select the variables, you can still try to use them to do variable selections. And these are the results that they got. And they are, as you can see, uh, we obtained really, really strong results compared to this um, existing strategy. It works really well to do this. You retrieve very often, very often in principle on a data set, you retrieve the correct variables. So what's the response questions, to the we, we will... performance? Is it, yes, is, it, yes. is it the analytical marginalization or what, what is it that makes it perform so well? Um, I, I, the, I, I think that the, the reason is quite simple. This is the fact that we have an exact form for the marginal likelihood. So you don't pay any price. You don't pay the price of using Laplace or sampling. Just it's just exact. So we believe this this comes from this comes from this. Okay. And um, um, I don't want to spend too too much of your of your time, so. I'm gonna conclude with this, which is one of the most striking results we got. So I could give you the results we, we got for the um, hospital, hospital in, in Paris, but essentially the, the, the variables we selected are, are useful in practice. They found them useful, but it's a little bit hard to talk about because it's, it's quite technical and we are not uh, uh, physicists or doctors. So I thought that this experiment would, would be more uh, useful to understand um, how relevant the method could be. So these are microarray data. And um, we used some techniques, unsupervised variable selection techniques to select the variables, right? So microarray data, and you wanna, you wanna select the variables. 
and um, right, so there are um, 300 um, patients, and this patients are related to breast cancer data, and this is the number of variables we have. So we this is very much uh, high dimensional, and so you you have a data set like a. 300 rows and 5,000 columns, and you just put them in a package and do variable selection. And these are the results for um, SPCA, TPCA, and the message we propose. And it's, it's kind of hard to say, okay, I do get some variables. So in, in, in this experiment, that means you select the genes. And that's kind of hard to say, okay, how good are the genes that I did select. So what people do is that they compute a so-called PEI index, which measures how many times those genes were found in practice to work together in cells. So this is something which is done um, through all the knowledge we have in biology. We found with some experiences that this gen, okay, this gen work, this gene works in a pathway with this one. It works with this one, et cetera, et cetera. So with this index, you compute how many times the set of genes you found have been found to work together in similar pathways. So the higher, the more coherent the genes you found are. Okay, and um, and this these are the these are the results we we got for some fixed cardinality. So this is the cardinality selected by TPCA. We are higher, much higher. This is the cardinality we selected, and this is the highest possible value of all. And this is the cardinality, so far more variables selected by sparse PCA, and they are lower. So that's that's the key ingredient. GSP PCA for any cardinality would select variables which are more relevant than the other strategy. And also look at this graph. Here, that's the um, this index, this pathway index, and this is the marginal likelihood. And look at the shapes. And we add the genes with the variational algorithm we have. So you start with no gene, and that's the index, and then the index goes up, etc., etc. It has a specific shape, and this is the shape of the marginal likelihood. So it's very interesting. Obviously, the peak is not exactly at the same place as this index is, but somehow it feels like the shape of this marginal likelihood um, is very relevant in, in practice. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stop here. Um, this is a work we, we, we did, this is, this is published. And since then we have proposed some extensions uh, if you want to look for our code on this, you can you you go on this uh, on this uh, web page. Um, I thank you very much, and um, I, I'll be very happy to to answer to some questions. Cool. Thanks very much. That was super interesting. Uh, while we're waiting for questions, maybe I can ask perhaps a boring, inevitable one, but but a, a question. <laughs> The, what, what, what is the dependency on the prior? Would you like select more or less variables if the priors were different? Is it is it robust to this or will it change a lot? Um, I don't know, and I can't really know because the in this in this domain you 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 choose the prior so wisely that uh, actually you when you get an exact expression for the marginal likelihood, usually you stop here. So you don't really know. Uh, you know that for all the other choices of priors you did, you did not get any exact expression, you know? But, so, but I, 
are there not um, hyperparameters in your expression for the marginal likelihood, or are they? But they are estimated. They are they are estimated. That it's just it's just alpha actually, and alpha okay. is estimated, and okay. the optimization is exact. So so depend the so dependency here is not in the alpha because the optimization is exact. The dependency is, is essentially in the in the Gaussian choice. Okay. And this is the only choice where we could get an exact expression here. But uh, so there's a there's a Gaussian prior or not? Uh... Gaussian prior, yes. So is there is there, is there a sensitivity to the hyperparameter like the mean and the variance on this or not not so much? Um, Maybe my question the, is too late. The, no, no, it's a, it's a, it's it's fine. Um, the, um, the we we could have tried the mean. I don't know what will happen with the mean. Uh, we chose to put a centered Gaussian, but with respect to the covariance, um, um, again, this um, I don't know. We yes, we, you you mean if we had used the full covariance? I don't know. I don't know what would have happened. I don't know if we could have obtained an exact expression. Um, but with this diagonal covariance matrix for the prior, you, you get an expression which is exact and which is easily maximized in alpha. And, the, and even the optimization is alpha is exact. Okay. So you so it's really a way a, to it leverage. It's really a default procedure and there's nothing to worry about. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. Are there any more questions? Oh, we've got one. Um, so one from uh, George D. At, did you consider any more fancy variational dis distributions, exam example, a full rank or a normalizing flows approach? No, we stay like a simple variational framework, um, like, a, like a simple VEM. That's very much a VEM with, um, uh, Gaussian, uh, the, the, the class of distribution we chose is, is Gaussian, right? So like we used Gaussian here for Y and we used Gaussian for W and you do a VEM with, uh, with this. Our goal was not to come up with something too clever for the variational approach or the inference part. We wanted to say that uh, even with the kind of naive or algorithm the, 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 you would get the U, which is okay. And then um, that maximizing U on this path of matter would make, would make sense. I mean, our goal was to insist on the last part on this optimization over the path of models. Because the marginal likelihood is exact, this works really well. Uh, any more questions? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Oh, Nicholas back. Okay. Uh, I'm so sorry for the audio problem at the beginning. Uh, I think it comes from Zoom, uh, the new setting in Zoom. Anyway, I wanted to ask um, when you do this pair PCA, uh, don't you mm -hmm. have a multimodality problem? For instance, imagine you have uh, 10 variables that would be explained well by two factors, and then 10 other variables that are not related that will also be explained by two completely different factors. So you decide to take two factors and then you have two competing explanation, this group of variable or that group of variable. Do you think that uh, might happen in this method or? So, um, sure, I, I'm pretty sure, yes. If we do look in practice, this is something that could, uh, I mean, um, this is something that we should definitely spend some time on. Yes, I do agree. Um, on simulations, I have to say that uh, we were very happy with this. It's very stable, but in practice, yes, this is something that we need to look at. Um, our idea was that uh, if you if you choose, um, can you still hear me? Yes. That was yes. Uh, if you choose um, uh, a latent space, you know the the D, because there are two three ingredients here. You have. Um, Let's let me go back to the conclusion. You have um, so you have p, so you don't have. Sorry. You have p, so no choice to be made. That's that's life. That's your data set. Um, 
you have Q. So this is the number of uh, estimated variables. So that's something that you want to you want to get from the algorithm. But that's there is also D. And our this is the, the dimension of the latent space. So something that I did not say here is that this is the strong dependency. Mm -hmm. The strong dependency here in this algorithm is in D. So um, all of this depends on how many latent dimensions you allow. Yes. Right. And um, my belief is that if D is large enough, you would be okay in estimating this. That's my guess. Okay. Because okay, otherwise, if you take D equal one, yes, then you are yes. you could you, would, uh, you could you explain would each variable quickly. by one factor, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. It would okay. be done very okay. yes. I do okay. agree. And um, just to mention, um, I didn't have the time, but we have obviously on the same framework we did the we expanded the strategy to not only estimate Q, but D as well. So you would, uh, in a principal way, you have a marginal likelihood, you want to estimate both the dimension of the latent space and Q, and you do things um, very much in the same recipe. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. That was uh, really interesting. I guess we, well, we can, uh, no more questions at this stage. So yeah, thank you. Um, sorry that you had me and not Nicola, but he's back. <laughs> um, uh, we'll, and I just realized our talk next week is on a, is on a holiday. So we might, uh, in France, and so we might re reschedule it to, a day, day before, day, day next, but then we are uh, doing do Yang. But yeah, thanks very much, Pierre. That was really great. One more thanks a lot. Okay. No, you're welcome. I'm clapping on for everyone. That was, uh, that was uh, very nice to, to see you. Um, I just wanted to say uh, to everyone, uh, take care of yourself. Uh, yeah. And I hope to be able to see you soon uh, in, uh, in real life. <laughs> Yeah, we're all looking forward to that, I think. Okay. Uh, <laughs> lots of people are saying thank you in the chat. So, uh, yeah, it's obviously appreciated. Cool. All right. Thank you very much. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.